This is the Everything History Podcast, and welcome to Episode 18, The Constitution and the Legislative Assembly. I discharge my last duty as king and emperor. This is Everything History. Everything you hold worthwhile is in the nation. We meant more to kids than Jesus did, or religion at that time. I consider myself the luckiest man. All right, we left the French Revolution just after the flight to Varennes, during which King Louis XVI, Queen Marie Antoinette, and their family failed to escape the country. They had tarried too long and after some bad luck were captured in the city of Varennes, and under guard the royalty had proceeded back into Paris with tens of thousands of Parisians watching their disgraceful procession in silence. Specifically, I left off with King Louis' explanation of why he had left, which had been written prior to his departure. He had explained that he and his family were leaving, or trying, because France, as he had known it, had fallen prey to radicalism and societal anarchy. All of this tumultuous action brought many issues immediately to the forefront. Indeed, many historians point to the failed flight to Varennes as the moment France and her politicians had to confront questions and issues that they had been avoiding since the autumn of 1789. William Doyle wrote exactly that, saying, quote, The flight to Varennes forced everybody to make choices that most would have preferred not to face, end quote. So what were some of these choices? Well, primarily they had to decide what to do with the king and the institution of the monarchy. These choices and much more are best explained, I think, by simply continuing our story. Therefore, it is on June 22nd of 1791 that we begin once more. Is the day after the failed flight and the National Constituent Assembly, in a surprise move, issued a proclamation declaring that the king had been abducted by conspirators and forced to leave. As you know, this was complete bullcrap, but the National Assembly proclaimed this in order to try and preserve peace throughout France. It seemed that the delegates were absolutely determined to preserve the monarchy, but only as a symbol, because soon after, the Assembly stripped King Louis of all executive control. But how are the people reacting? Did they agree with the early moves by the assembly? Also, how did the rest of Europe and the world react? This is very important to know because public opinion in revolutionary France could change the fate of the new nation and Europe as a whole. If the people sympathized with the king or were understanding in any way, radicalism and republicanism would have had no political leverage or traction to take control. However, If the public were outraged and took to the streets against the royals and the monarchy, then the radicals in the government would have had a golden opportunity to seize control over revolutionary France. So with that in mind, how did the political clubs and the Parisian press react? Well, not calmly to say the least. The overwhelming majority of voices from June and July spoke horribly of the king, the queen, and their family. Newspapers, pamphlets, and journals seem to unanimously hate the monarchy. Jacques Hibert epitomizes this thinking when he wrote, quote, You, my king, you are no longer my king. You are nothing but a cowardly deserter. From one end of France to the other, there is only an outcry against you and your debauched Messalini. Messalini, by the way, had been the wife of Emperor Claudius way back during the early Roman Empire, who had been executed for conspiring to assassinate her husband. Messalina was also a bit of a prostitute. So it seemed that everyone outside the assembly wanted to rid themselves of all traces of royalty, and these actions were made still more clear in late June and July when the political clubs began petitioning the National Constituent Assembly on the fate of their king. Yes, on June 24th, a petition by the Cordeliers Club, a radical club if you recall, was escorted by over 30,000 people to make sure the assembly read their request. The petition demanded that the king be removed from power or let the national population decide his fate. But the request was too much and the assembly tabled the discussion. So, so far, that's how the political clubs were reacting. But what about the people? Well, they were in a state of shock and fear, and while almost all agreed when Hebert called the king a, quote, cowardly deserter, they were not so sure why he did it. A conspiracy theory began to be spread that the king, General Bouilly, and Austria had planned the entire escape so King Louis could return at the head of foreign armies and reinstitute absolute monarchy in France. Yet as wild as that sounds, the people actually began to believe it, and the populace began to connect the dots that weren't really there. Everything seemed to confirm these dark suspicions. General Bouilly and his forces were in safety in the Austrian Netherlands. The king's own brother held court in Austria. The king was bound for Austrian territory, and Queen Marie Antoinette herself was the sister of the Austrian emperor, Leopold II. 
Thus, everyone began to fear an Austrian invasion, and National Guardsmen began to be raised along the northern borders. And while we know this conspiracy theory is not true, they sure as heck did not, and these fears seemed to be realized when Emperor Leopold II of Austria and the Germanic dominions wrote to royalty throughout Europe saying, quote, I am sure that your majesty will have learned of the unheard of attempt to arrest the king of France, the queen, my sister, and the royal family. I propose to the kings of Spain, England, Prussia, Naples, and Sardinia, as well as the empress of Russia, that they should join together with myself and take measures to restore the liberty and honor to the most Christian king and his family, and set limits to the dangerous excesses of the French Revolution. These are important words, especially the final words the emperor said, that Europe should, quote, set limits to the dangerous excesses of the French Revolution. And thus, because of language like this and the printing presses and what the political clubs were trying to do, fear was in the air by mid-July, and more violence was bound to break out in revolutionary France. On July 15th, the political clubs were at it again. The Jacobin Club's radical leaders, primarily Danton and Jacques-Pierre Brissot, wanted to form a petition-signing event on the Champ de Mars. But their meeting broke out into a screaming match. The conservative delegates were furious because the petition called for the abdication of the throne by King Louis and hinted that the next monarch should be voted on by the people. The conservatives believed that such language was intentionally trying to incite riots. The Jacobin Club then fractured with the conservatives led by Lafayette and LeMay, permanently leaving the club to form their own political club called the Foulance Club, or the Friends of the Constitution. Every single assembly delegate followed, except for Robespierre, but not even Robespierre agreed with the new petition, and he convinced the rest of the Jacobins to call off the event. And this was a momentous moment in French politics, because, for better or worse, <coughs> worse the Jacobin Club had lost all of its conservative voices. Yet shockingly, the petition crisis did not stop because the Cordeliers Club stepped in and organized the signing ceremony themselves. It commenced on July 17th, and over 50,000 people gathered to sign the document. But the ceremony quickly devolved into anarchy. The crowd was filled with extremists, and violence broke out in the early morning hours. At least two people were lynched, and the mayor of Paris, Bailly, declared martial law. The crowd then shifted from a somewhat unstable entity to a mob of crazed citizens. General Lafayette and the National Guard arrived bearing a red flag to disperse the tens of thousands of frenzied Parisians, but, you guessed it, they refused to leave. What happened next is somewhat unknown because we can't be quite sure of who shot first. The general consensus, though, is that the mob held their ground and began pelting the National Guard with stones and evidently began firing on the guardsmen, which does seem plausible. And thus the National Guard fired back on the mob, in any event, there were a couple dozen Parisian casualties, and the event was dubbed the Massacre on the Champ de Mars. Now, this event gets blown out of proportion in terms of violence, much like the Boston Massacre that preceded the American Revolution, because several radicals write that the guardsmen were murdering the people, quote, like chickens, and that the field was drowning with the blood of assassinated citizens. Clearly, that's not true, because only a couple dozen or so actually got struck out of the tens of thousands present. And I don't want to be shallow, but the term massacre in this context is a misnomer. It should be replaced with tragedy or riot, but that's me inserting opinion and bias. I interject with my bias here because I know the rest of the story, and therefore I know that the massacre on the Champ de Mars will become a sort of rallying cry for quote-unquote liberty, extreme republicanism, and terror in 1792 and 93. Yet that remains in the distant future. Continuing on with our story, we find that the conservatives and monarchists actually managed to re-exert control over France. The National Assembly began a crackdown on radicalism and several hundred brigands and treasonous or extreme activists were arrested. George Danton fled to England and Desmoulins and Marat, both of whom I have previously quoted, disappeared into hiding. The Corps de Leaders Club was decimated by the crackdown and the Jacobin Club lacked political momentum to resist. It seemed that the golden opportunity for a wave of republicanism had been stomped out as the National Assembly switched gears in August of 1791. They left the controversy surrounding the flight to Varennes behind them and set about completing the new French constitution. As you might imagine, the constitution was quite complicated and it contained essentially all the legislation and laws passed since the National Assembly and its successor to the National Constituent Assembly began meeting in June of 1789. The passing of such measures, or the ratifying of them, in a constitution was meant to have those laws and their principles ingrained in the foundation of the French nation. 
However, there were a few last-minute changes made. The majority of the civil constitution of the clergy, for example, which had been so controversial, was struck from the law books. And the voting system was also tweaked a little bit. The constitution of 1791 was then passed by the assembly in late August and ratified by King Louis on September 13th. There was much more going on in France than constitution building, though, in the late summer months. Because finally, a restriction on the freedom of press was made law on August 23rd that stated that no author of any genre was allowed to, quote, deliberately provoke disobedience to the law, and that anyone resisting the order was subject to prosecution by the powers that be. Now, what this meant is that the years of ridiculously slanderous and seditious pamphleteering had come to an end, at least for the near future. The only major opponent to the legislation was Robespierre. I also want to stop right here to point something out. If this law had been passed, say, sometime in the late 1780s and readily enforced, much of the violence and anarchy of the revolution may have been avoided. Yet I do realize that prior to August of 1791, there had been too many radicals to allow such a law to pass. And for years, writers had been allowed to publish absolutely false and downright treasonous papers, journals, posters, and pamphlets. And such unrestricted press had rallied people to violent frenzies dozens of times, which is what this law sought to prevent. This law was not restricting anyone's ability to write or publish, it was restricting their ability to incite violence and disorder on the French state. Very similar laws govern society today. Moving on, elections were also held on August 27th. The election nominated the delegates to the new legislative assembly, and with the constitution ratified, the National Constituent Assembly would now hand over the government to the legislative assembly, which began meeting on October 1st, 1791. Now, the Legislative Assembly was from its inception far, far different from the National Assembly. The new body contained no previous delegates to the National Assemblies because the National Constituent Assembly itself had decreed in the spring that no current delegate could stand for election. So, rather, the new Assembly was made up of 745 well-born men described as highly intellectual, but what the group had in talent they lacked in experience. And as for their political affiliation, approximately 136 were Jacobins, and another 300 or so sided with the Foulons Club. The other 300 plus members did not outright declare an affiliation as of yet. Yet it is a mistake to believe by those numbers that the Legislative Assembly, or France at large for that matter, was going to stay conservative for much longer. Yes, and as I have been noting, the Foulons Club, founded by Lafayette, Barnave, and LeMay, held influence at the moment, but the Foulons were not popular, and even if they were, their popularity was dwindling. Now why? That's a great question. Well, you see, the Foulons Club was far more private than the Jacobins. The public could not attend Foulons meetings, and the founding members, Lafayette and the like, did not attend because they did not want to interfere, whatever that meant. The Jacobins, though, as I have mentioned in previous episodes, had meetings open to the public. This and other factors caused the Foulons Club to stagnate as a political power and the Jacobins to once again rise. So much so that by December the Foulons had lost all of their previous influence and the Jacobin Club was again the leading political entity, with all of the prominent Legislative Assembly members being at least attendees of the Jacobin Club's meetings. Now don't worry, now don't worry I haven't skipped over October and November, so as I reset to early October... What about the previous leading men of France? What are they doing? I'm talking about Marquis de Lafayette, Robespierre, Jérôme Pétion, Jacques-Pierre Brissot, Antoine Barnave, Alexander Lemay, and Le Chapelier. Now, I know that was a mouthful, and you don't have to know all that at all, but I'll explain it anyways. Well, the already popular hero, Pétion, was elected mayor, handily beating out Lafayette. Robespierre himself was elected as a public accuser in criminal court and regularly led Jacobin meetings. As for Lafayette, he resigned his post in the National Guard, and after failing to be elected as mayor of Paris, he returned home to the province of Auvergne. And Jacques Brissot was now a leading member of the Legislative Assembly, and Barnave retired to Grenoble and advised Queen Marie Antoinette through a massive series of letters. Alexander Lemay and Le Chapelier both retired for the time being as well. So back to the Legislative Assembly. Their first order of business was back to an old issue. Immigration and how the government was to deal with emigre. Indeed, immigration with an E was now at an all-time high in France, and thousands of prominent individuals and their families had escaped since the flight to Varennes. And in the Legislative Assembly, Jacques-Pierre Brissot proposed a radical new set of laws in early November, 
The laws proposed would have given the government leave to seize all property of citizens that had left the nation without the leave of the Legislative Assembly, and the proposal also declared that all those abroad were to be suspected of plotting against France, and if they did not return by January 1st, 1792, they were guilty of a capital crime. Despite how ridiculous that sounds, the decree was passed and sent to King Louis, who vetoed it on November 11th. Brissot and the Jacobins, who were rising rapidly once more, were absolutely furious, but the king was well within his rights to do so. And other issues prompted the Legislative Assembly to move on. They had to deal with the priests that still refused to take an oath to the nation, and they also had to deal with the possibility of war. Yes, it was well known by late November that Austria and Prussia were amassing forces on the northern borders. And this issue was made even more problematic when reports streamed in that a majority of the emigre were escaping to the Austrian military camps in the north. And that is where I must stop this episode. Next time on the Everything History Podcast, we will continue with the French Revolution. The Legislative Assembly begins shifting to extreme republicanism, and war with Austria seems inevitable. And remember, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, make sure to email me at everythinghistorypodcast at gmail.com. And if you like what you heard, make sure to subscribe on iTunes. Thank you very much.